What's up, everyone? We're back. I'm Dr. Shah. Dr. Maxfield. Welcome back to our channel, Doctorly, where we talk about all things skincare, but also some hardcore dermatology stuff. And today, we got a request from an Instagram Live. We went on Instagram Live on Dr. Maxfield's channel. Go make sure you follow him. And we asked the question, what do you all want to hear about today? So today, we're going to be talking about a question that came out of the chat, which is what is skin cancer and how do you identify skin cancer? So this video will be our skin cancer video. Right, and this is a very important topic. Hopefully this serves as a nice point of reference for people in the future, watching this now and in the future, because we're gonna talk about some of the most common skin cancers, how they occur, what to do if you get them, and some of the basics about what we do to take care of them, because it's a lot more than you'd think sometimes. This is skin cancer, here we go, here we go. Skin cancer. I personally had skin cancer. We maybe have mentioned it in YouTube videos before. Early in my dermatology residency, I noticed that I had a pink bump that was growing on my chest and I never really had anything like it. It didn't go away. It wasn't getting any bigger and it actually itched a little bit. It was like a little bit like I noticed it was there. And then suddenly it started to become a little bit unlike the rest of my skin meaning that it, when it would get irritated, it would actually start to bleed a little bit. So I was like, this is kind of weird. Let's go get it checked out. I showed it to Dr. Maxfield, said it was nothing. And uh, I just went on with my, no. <laughs> what ended up happening was I showed it uh, to some of my colleagues around it. I had suspicions that it was skin cancer, but I couldn't like really see closely based on the location. They looked at it with the dermatoscope and they said, actually, we're not sure, but we're gonna biopsy it. They biopsy it, it comes back, and it ends up being a basal cell skin cancer. So let's form a hierarchy first. There are three main types of skin cancer that you hear a lot about. Now with recent headlines, Merkel cell carcinoma is also something people are talking about more frequently. Let's focus on the top three because those are the ones that most of you will encounter either in your own lives or you'll have a friend or a family member that develops one of these in their lifetime. So the three main causes of skin cancer are basal cell skin cancer, squamous cell skin cancer, and then melanoma skin cancer, basal cell being the least severe, squamous cell being the second least or middle severe or more severe and the melanoma being the most severe and that's also the same order in which they occur so basal cells are most common and melanoma is the least common those are your common skin cancers and what causes these so there's always a complex combination of genetics and environment the major contributing factor is the sun like our bodies have a love-hate relationship with our entire environment and the sun is no exception sun has uv rays uvb is the predominant wavelength that contributes to skin cancer Cancer. The DNA of our skin cells are the perfect chromophore, so to speak. That's the word we use to say that that's the structure that absorbs that wavelength most effectively and efficiently. Your DNA absorbs UVB. It actually causes changes in the DNA over time. Your body tries to repair that, but eventually it all adds up until it can't anymore. And then you have a skin cancer. It's multifactorial. Some wart types can cause squamous cell skin cancers, but the sun is the major cause. The way that skin cancer or any cancer works in general is almost like a, I don't wanna say like a video game, but in the sense that you develop skills in your video game with time as, as you level up essentially. So the first insult to your DNA could be that your skin didn't replicate the way that it was supposed to. Then the sun hits the DNA, damages it further. And it basically gets to the point where your body can't keep this abnormal cell in check. And then it starts to develop new skills with time. So every time it replicates, it starts to level up and get more skills. And those skills are not good things. We don't want our skin cancer cells to develop more and more skills. And it gets the ability to then eventually, like Dr. Maxfield said, invade deeper into the skin, get larger and larger locally, and then eventually spread to either the lymph nodes or all across the entire body. This doesn't happen overnight. It happens after cumulative damage, essentially. The thing, and it's universally true about all types of cancer, is that the early earlier you catch it, the better off that you're gonna be, which is why surveillance, which means looking for these things before they occur or while they're very early is really important. It makes a world of difference. So the next part of this video, we'll talk to you about those common types of skin cancers, tell you what to be looking for so that you can maybe notice something early on you, your loved ones, and then bring it to our attention sooner, or some doctor or dermatologist in the office. So the first one we'll talk about is a basal cell skin cancer. You know what they really look like? Two most common scenarios. They either start out looking like a pimple that just won't go away, because they're pearly, they have little dilated blood vessels on them, or just a non-healing scar. And I think they used to call these like rodent ulcers a few generations back, but a small non-healing sore 
or a pimple that just doesn't go away on a sun damaged area is highly indicative of a basal cell, especially if you have a dilated blood vessel that's fairly prominent across it. They really can look like anything. Even basal cells can be pigmented to some degrees. I often see pigmented basal cell carcinomas that a lot of people would think would be a melanoma, but as soon as a dermatologist looks at it, you know right away, this is a pigmented basal cell skin cancer. Invariably, like Dr. Maxfield is saying about really pretty much all forms of cancer, is almost always gonna be caused by the sun. Now, if you have a lighter skin tone, you're uh, you know, Fitzpatrick type one, and you have freckles and red hair, you're gonna be higher risk of developing these forms of skin cancer. That being said, I am not any of those things, and I developed a basal cell skin cancer. The good thing about basal cell skin cancer is that it's the least aggressive, so once you identify it, it's easy to treat, usually most of the time, as long as it's not too advanced and it's not in a very tricky location, but we usually just treat these with a myriad of different types of treatments. And we'll talk a little bit about how to treat these at the end, and we'll talk about how I ended up treating mine. Now let's talk about the next type of skin cancer, which is the second most common cause of skin cancer, which is squamous cell skin cancer. Right, and this type of skin cancer starts out with a precursor. So just like colon cancer, where you get these little polyps that have the potential to perhaps invade deep, continue down that cancerous route, you have these things called actinic keratoses. These are firm, fixed, little scaly bumps, again, on a sun-damaged background, that just don't go away. And those eventually, over time, accumulate mutations, accumulate cancer cells. You see it under the microscope, just goes from like a layer thick, full thickness, to invasive into the skin. And then you have your squamous cell skin cancer. Again, you're looking for a non-healing sore or something thick, and scaly that's fairly firm and they can even be a bit tender when they get thicker and cause pressure or even invade a local nerve. Now these ones like Dr. Shaw mentioned they are a little more aggressive than basal cells and meaning that they have a higher risk of metastasis or spreading throughout the body especially on the lips and the ears. Those do have a metastasis rate of up to 15 percent over the course of your lifetime. That is something that's very important to take care of and again the earlier you catch it the much easier it's going to be to take care of it. Right. So what do you look for with this? Like Dr. Maxfield said, red, flaky, bleeding, bump that's not healing. And if you've ever seen a dermatologist and you're over the age of, let's say, 45, and they froze something and didn't explain really much what they were freezing, <laughs> what most likely they were freezing was something called an actinic keratosis, which is that precursor lesion that he mentioned earlier. And the reason why we freeze these, or the reason why we treat these, or the reason why we try to prevent these actinic keratoses is because if they're left untreated, eventually over time, not tomorrow, again, these are things that have to develop a skill set to basically invade deeper and get bigger, eventually these actinic keratoses turn into squamous cell skin cancers and we try to treat them before they get to that point. Right, and so while the sun is the major contributing cause for these, HPV virus is another cause of squamous cell skin cancer. There are lung squamous cell skin cancers, there's head and neck squamous cell skin cancers, there's some from smoking, there's some from chewing tobacco that occur in the mouth. So it's actually a type of skin cancer that has many different causes and all those behave very differently. And we're focusing on just the skin portion of the squamous cell skin cancer here. So now let's talk about the least common and most aggressive form of skin cancer. And there's been quite a lot of public education on this form of skin cancer because it's a little bit easier to identify than the other two that we talked about that are a little bit more nondescript and can just simply look like a pimple. This is a melanoma skin cancer. So melanoma is very aggressive. It originates from melanocytes, which are the pigment producing cells of our skin. So we have little cells called melanocytes. They produce melanin and that's what gives us pigment. That's what gives us a tan. Eventually they develop some type of abnormality in them and then they start to grow abnormally and then what you end up getting is usually and this is scary to say that it's not always the case but usually you end up with a brown spot or a black spot that starts to look abnormal and the main way to identify this is the a b c d ease of melanoma and we'll talk a little bit about that next but just bear in mind that you can also have melanomas that are what we call amelanotic meaning that they actually don't have pigment in them which is scary for dermatologists because they're hard to identify and often go missed but just so, just so you know not every melanoma is actually going to be pigmented Right. Um, for those that are, that's what we're trying to equip you to find. So A stands for asymmetry. B stands for irregular borders. C is multiple different colors, like three or more colors. D is diameter, six millimeters or a pencil eraser size. E is one of the most important ones, and that's evolving. 
meaning that it's changing over time. And our moles do change with us. Like I tell younger patients, especially up to mid twenties, your moles do grow with you a little bit, but beyond that, you really shouldn't have any changing or new moles. And then there's another one called the ugly duckling sign. That's a pretty strong predictor actually. And that's if you have a lot of moles, you have your own pattern, all your moles look alike, but one stands out. I, I rely on that pretty heavily as well. And that's a good predictor that it could be a mole, a bad mole, and uh, maybe a melanoma. So. With these pictures, hopefully that can help guide you into knowing what to look for for these. Right, so that ugly duckling sign ends up being super helpful for both what I decide to biopsy and what I decide not to biopsy. So when I first look at somebody and I see a mole that looks funny to me, I look at it closely and I say, wow, this has some abnormal features. Maybe it has some asymmetry. Maybe it has two colors in it. And then I say, let me look at the rest of this person mm -hmm. to see what does their moles normally look like. They might have 20 moles that are asymmetric and have two colors in them. And then I say to myself, this is their signature mole. They just make moles that look funny. But they may have moles that all look the same and then all of a sudden they have one mole that's just blacker or it's it got more jagged edges. And then you say, this is the ugly duckling and this is the one that should be biopsied. But usually the ugly ducklings are the ones that your friends, your family members, your wife, your husband is telling you, this mole doesn't look good, go get it checked out. And you say, no, I'll wait till tomorrow. It's fine. Oh, the dermatologist is booked. Oh, I have to go to my primary care. This is not something to push off. If you have something that looks abnormal, I really, I can't tell you how many times in my career, and I'm early career, remember, patients have come in where their wives or husbands have told them, you should get this checked out. They blew it off and they came in finally to get this ugly duckling checked out and then it ended up being a melanoma. This is almost always the story. So if you have something that looks abnormal, like I said, the earlier you catch it, the better off that you are. So just you know, take a day, take a few hours, go get it checked out, at least get the reassurance that it's either nothing or if it is something we can biopsy and hopefully treat it if it's early enough. Yeah, that brings us to the treatment options and we'll lump this into surgical and non-surgical. And so for surgical options, we're basically trying to destroy or remove it. And for something early, depending on the severity, range from something called electrodesiccation and curatage, we basically numb it, scrape it a few layers into the skin, but not through the skin. So this is for your early skin cancers where there's not a significant depth or you're not on any sort of sensitive area. If however you have invasive roots, then you're going to be doing an excision or if you have an aggressive skin cancer like a melanoma, then you don't want to leave any skin behind. You wanna capture it all and so you'll do an excision where you cut through the skin. You have to take normal appearing skin to capture the microscopic cancer cells that are in the area and then convert that into a line-like or curvy linear scar. For more aggressive skin cancers, then we have something called Mohs surgery or on high risk locations like the face, hands, groin, feet, shins, where you actually cut it out look at it under the microscope while you're there to ensure the highest possible cure rate, complete margin examination, and then perhaps more complex closure, especially useful around the face where if you can't just go in a straight line. So surgically, those are your primary options for most of the common types of skin cancers. And we'll do a much more detailed video on Mohs surgery specifically, Dr. Maxfield, does a ton of Mohs surgery in clinic. And so we even show you some videos of some Mohs surgery procedures as well. So you can see what that procedure looks like because it is different than other skin cancer procedures. Now, remember this because some of you are watching this video now because you've either been diagnosed with skin cancer or you're post skin cancer surgery and you're coming to this video now. The procedure is always gonna be bigger than the initial lesion. So if you have a lesion and it's just five millimeters big, you would think, well, why wouldn't my surgery just be that big and then they close it. One, like you said, you have to take normal skin around it. And that amount of normal skin has been determined by multiple studies. We either can take a whole centimeter around the lesion, sometimes two centimeters around the lesion, sometimes just a half a centimeter around the lesion. So depending on how aggressive that initial skin cancer is, that's gonna determine whether or not you're gonna have a very large scar or not. And in order to close it, you can't close a circle into a line. So you actually have to take little triangles off the edge of it. And so that's another reason why your scar might actually be a lot longer than you anticipate. So I just want you to keep in mind that that's the case. Right, and that's important consideration. I always stress that to my patients because it is hard to envision ahead of time. So it's a very important thought. And then after surgeries, then you have radiation, which is always an acceptable option. This has really progressed a long way where you use superficial, very localized radiation. I know you had a lot of experience with this up at Fora Dermatology, and it's, again, a very cosmetically appreciable treatment and a very effective for a lot of different types of skin cancer. If, however, 
the skin cancer is very aggressive and it has metastasized. You have lymph node involvement, other options like immunotherapy or chemotherapy are on board. And these are not the same thing. So chemotherapy is basically, it's like a nuke. You drop just something very destructive into your body. You wipe out a lot of different things and hopefully the skin cancer is a bystander that also gets hit. There is some selectivity in it, so I don't want you to think this is like a thoughtless destruction because they all do have different mechanisms that are more targeted towards different things, but it is more like an overarching theme to just damage a lot of things. Cancer in general gets attacked too. Immunotherapy has revolutionized the cancer world and it can afford miraculous cures, although that's not the rule, it's still the exception. But there are a lot of different immunotherapy treatments now. We wrote a paper on one of them earlier on and it turns on your immune system so that your immune system can attack the cancer. And there are, again, multiple different options, gene selective targeted treatments, but different things that a select person might need for an advanced skin cancer as well. We've gotten very specific with these treatments now. You can specifically treat the root mutation that is causing basal cell skin cancer when you have very aggressive basal cell skin cancers that have either metastasized or have gotten locally very, very large. I think that's beyond the scope of this video right now, but ultimately these are like the range of your treatments. You also have your topical chemotherapeutic mm -hmm. agents as well. So we have topical 5-fluorouracil. Some people refer to it as Effidex. Skin cancer is already a little bit challenging to treat at that point. Now, it's sometimes indicated for people that have very superficial skin cancers, but for the most part, this is gonna be used for people that have that actinic keratosis we were talking about. So people use it as a field treatment to get rid of all that damage without individually trying to remove those one by one. Now this type of treatment ends up causing a big red reaction on the face, but what it does is it targets those skin cells that are already abnormal and on their way to skin cancer. The other topical option that we have is a really good option for those basal cell skin cancers, especially when they're superficial, is something called the Miquimod. It's an immunomodulator that also boosts your immune system locally to help to destroy skin cancer cells. So we have some topical options, we have some surgical options, and then we also have some chemotherapeutic and immunotherapeutic options for cancers nowadays. The main thing is, if you have something abnormal, you definitely wanna get it checked out as soon as possible. And when you see us, if we're also suspicious about it, the next step is always to do a biopsy of the lesion. Biopsy is when we take a scraping of the lesion and we send it off to the lab for analysis. That's not a surgery at that point, that's us just getting a sample so we can know what the next step is, whether it's gonna be surgery, immunotherapy, chemotherapy or nothing at all. So just a brief mention, because we do know that this is like very relevant just with recent events and Jimmy Buffett is Merkel cell carcinoma. This is one of many rare skin cancers. So we talked about the common three. This is not all of them. Skin cancers is a huge collection of different types of cancers. There unfortunately are hundreds. Most of them are pretty rare. Thankfully, Merkel cell carcinoma is something a dermatologist may see a handful of times in their lifetime. I've unfortunately diagnosed a patient with one as well. But Merkel cell carcinoma is contributed by the sun, also a virus, polyomavirus endpoint is DNA damage. They can be particularly locally aggressive. They can also be widespread. The reason that this is a hard one to counsel on is there's not a classic clinical appearance and we can't tell you exactly what to look for with this one. Yeah, so this is another one that can just simply look like a pimple. Um, it can be red, it can be skin colored. Um, again, it's just something that wasn't there before and that usually suddenly appeared and usually you'll notice it before anybody else notices it. Um, and Every time I've biopsied Merkel cell carcinoma, which has only been a few times, I didn't suspect it was going to be Merkel cell carcinoma and really nobody else did. We do have a dermatologist we worked with um, that could for some reason pick out a Merkel cell, which is very unusual to even have that in your differential, but it is something that, that's aggressive that can spread rapidly. I think the main thing is not to lose sleep over something like this, but that if you just have something abnormal, get it checked out and then we'll confirm the diagnosis for you. So hopefully this collection of diagnoses, options, treatments is gonna be helpful for you. Um, so whether you're wondering if you have a skin cancer or you have one and wondering what's gonna happen, this can hopefully provide you some guidance. Um, but we greatly appreciate you just being a part of this with us here today. And thank you for asking us to make this video. Hopefully you find this helpful and we'll see you all in the next video. We'll see you next time.